for today. If you could stand with me, we have, if you can stand, we have it up on the, uh, on the screen there. We're continuing our John series. We're, we're in John 3.16 uh, today. So we'll read it together as we do. It says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Next slide. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. You can grab a seat. And let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would steady our hearts to hear your word this morning. Lord, that you would open our ears, open our eyes, that we would see your truth. Lord, that you would strengthen us in the one thing that gives us strength, and that is yourself. Help us to understand that we may walk in strength according to the knowledge of your will. Pray that you would speak through me, Lord. Keep me from error. Whatever your will is today, Lord, let it be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So good morning again. Uh, It's good to be back with you all as we study the book of John. Uh, And this, you know, as as we've just been going through it, you know, we started this in October. uh, And we're just halfway through chapter three. You know, and as we crawl through it, I I just, you know, this book is so rich with truth uh, and so rich with just God speaking to us. And and I realize, like, God's mercy is this. If this was the only book we had, if the book of John was it, or we could say that for any book, we would be overwhelmed with the revelation that God has given to man, that we might know him, that we might worship him, uh, that we would be overwhelmed with his, his might, his power, his grace, right? But God's mercy abounds so much beyond what we can even comprehend, that he has given us book after book of revelation to speak to man and show his character and love. Amen? Sorry, they're making a disruption over there. So let's get into the the word today. So as we work our way through the verses this morning, uh, we're going to see four truths, okay? I have them up there. If you're taking notes, you could jot these things down. I apologize. They don't all start with the same letter and they don't all rhyme, but they're there, all right? They're truths from Scripture. Just, just a man. So here's, here's what we see, though, in these, in these verses this morning. We see, first, condemnation is man's default state. We see, second, that God loved the world. We see, third, that love is demonstrated in action. And fourth, finally, what we do is going to reflect what we believe. And Inversely, what we believe is going to determine what we do. So those are four truths that I really want to get a hold of today because as I, as I was just studying this, the Lord was showing me, you know, what we believe matters and it's going to affect what we do. And so we have to know what the word of God says. We have to know what we believe and how do we know it? We see God speak it to us through his word. So first, the Bible shows us that condemnation is man's default state. Now, when I say default, I don't mean original state. I mean post-fall. I mean our condition if God never intervened after the fall. It is the natural state of every man and woman ever born with the exception, of course, of Jesus Christ. Now, here's what I mean. John 3, 17. If you have your Bibles, we'll be back and forth through this, so I'll have it up on the screen there, but it's probably good if you have it open in front of you as well. John 3, 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. Now, do you you catch that? That's a lot there, but listen. 
Whoever does not believe is condemned already. That is that Jesus didn't come to the world and then people were condemned. Mankind already stood condemned before Jesus came into the world. Why? Because people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Now that verse, when I'm looking at that, I think, oh yeah, their, their deeds were evil. Those, those people, their deeds are evil and so they hate the light. It's not just talking about people who reject Christ. That's talking about mankind. That's talking about all people. Look, none of us were born loving Jesus. Nobody in this room was born with a heart set on righteousness. Last week we read Isaiah 53. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. Romans 3.23, Paul writes that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Psalm 14, the psalmist writes that the Lord looked down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Now if you remember the context of the verses that we're looking at here in John chapter 3, Jesus was just talking with Nicodemus. All right, he's telling him that a man can't count on his natural state. He can't count on his first birth or his flesh to get him into the kingdom of God, right? He needs a second birth, a spiritual birth that makes a way where the flesh can find no way. And that is a work of the spirit, not a work of the flesh. So it's helpful to think of it like this maybe as I was was praying over this, right? Scripture says that our righteousness, even our righteousness, our best deeds are like filthy rags, right? And uh, I wear glasses, I wear contacts most of the time, but I don't know how many you wear glasses, you'll, you'll be able to relate. But let's say your glasses are dirty, right? And you need to clean them. Now all you have is some filthy rag that you use to change the oil, right? You can scrub those glasses all day long with what you've got, but your vision will still be distorted. Do you understand? That's what it's like when the flesh tries to reform the flesh. We need something that we don't possess. And it should be enough that scripture teaches this, right? But we see it confirmed in our lives if we're honest, don't we? John says, people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. See, we see the cause and effect here, right? People hate the light and they love the darkness because they know that their deeds are evil. See, they're not entirely ignorant because God has placed a universal moral standard in the hearts of man, however diminished it is, however, however minimized it is from his perfect righteousness, he has put in the hearts of man a, a, a idea of a moral standard. At some level, listen, people know what's right, even if they refuse to do it. Now that's not to say that there are some people out there who have so hardened their hearts and so distorted the truth that they, they truly can't even see anymore that glimmer of moral truth. But that, that's not the way they were born. They were born in a fallen state, but they were born with, a, with this, that's not fair, you know? Kids are quick to say that. They have some idea of right and wrong. But th- this, this happens from years of suppressing and distorting the truth until, as Paul says in Romans 1, that they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened and finally God gives them up in the lusts of their hearts. But even, listen, even in trying to justify their own selfishness, or our own selfishness, by trying to make it appear right, they expose the fact that there is such a thing as a moral standard. Right? Do you catch that? You might pervert and twist this out of shape, but even by doing that, they are admitting that there is such a thing as right and wrong. Just recently, I heard uh, one of my kids, they shall remain nameless to protect the innocent. Well, they're not innocent, but to protect them anyway. And, and he, he was giving another one of my children a hard time. He was teasing him. And the victim, I heard him asking him to stop. You know, stop, 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 right? And he was just relentless. He was just digging in. And he didn't know that I was in the next room downstairs. Uh, and so I walked up. 
kind of peek around the corner, and I looked into the room, and I watched him teasing his brother for a couple of seconds before he noticed me. What do you think he did when he saw me? He stopped, right? Now, I didn't say a word, but he stopped what he was doing. Now, listen, if he was ignorant of the fact that what he was doing was wrong, he wouldn't have stopped, would he? He would have kept going. What reason would he have to stop if he was genuinely ignorant of the fact that he was doing something wrong? But the fact is he did know that he was doing something wrong, didn't he? In John chapter 9, Jesus heals a man born blind. After he heals him, Jesus says to those around him, he says, for judgment, I came into this world. For judgment, I came into this world. For those who do not, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. And some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. See, if this child of mine, who shall remain nameless, was really blind to the fact that he was being cruel to his brother, he would not be guilty. Did they just expose him? (laughs) But listen carefully. The guilt was already there. Even before I came into the room, even before I showed up, he knew he was doing wrong. My presence just forced him to confront it. All right? And that is what Jesus is saying. He didn't come to the world to condemn the world. The condemnation upon man was already there. The guilt was already there because we knew our deeds were evil. But he came in judgment because his presence forces people to make a decision. And so after standing there for a moment, I said, you know, the dad thing goes on. So do you think you were acting in love just now? And he sheepishly admits, he says, no. And so then I asked that dad question. Then why were you doing it? And he says, I don't know. And you know, in large part, I think he was telling the truth. I don't think he really did know why he was doing it, but I know, and I was happy to tell him. (laughs) It's because our hearts are naturally inclined toward evil. And as much as we try to rewrite culture to hide the fact, we know that our deeds are evil. So we hide from the light lest we be exposed. And if we skip ahead a bit, if you have your Bibles open, just look to the end of that chapter, John 3.36. John 3.36, John writes this. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but, listen, the wrath of God remains on him. Notice that the wrath of God doesn't suddenly descend upon him. It remains on him. It was already there. See, we are all born under the wrath of God. And it is a just wrath. You don't, don't tell me that's not fair. It is a just wrath. It is our rightful due. In fact, as we talked about last week, God could not be a just God unless he reserved his wrath for those who were in violation of his righteous and perfect standard. His wrath toward unrighteousness, listen, his wrath toward unrighteousness is part of his righteousness. And so we see this truth, that outside of Christ, the natural state of man is condemnation and wrath. That was number one. That's a sobering reality that all of us must come to, and it is God's mercy if we do come to know that reality, because listen, in that fallen, natural state, the Bible says that our vision is cloudy, that we have blinders on even to our own state, and unless he's the one who cleans our glasses, we're never gonna see good enough to see clearly. We're never going to clean them. But in his mercy, God opens up our eyes and he leads us to this next truth, number two, that God loved the world. See, God loves what he created. Even in its fallen state, God loves what he created. Now hear me right. God doesn't love sin, but God has loved sinful man. And again, in the context of of this following right after Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, we have to recognize the significance of the wording. He's speaking to Nicodemus, a Pharisee. And listen to what John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. 
See, Nicodemus and many of the Jews of his day were expectantly waiting for, a, uh, for the Messiah. They were waiting for a Jewish Messiah to deliver the Jewish nation. And here John tells us that God so loved the world. I always just picture the Jews being like, wait, 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 hold on. You mean for God so loved the Jews that he gave his own, right? But John, John, I think, is very intentional. God so loved the world that he gave us his son. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody in the world is saved. There is, there is a heresy out there called universalism that, that suggests that, but the verse defeats it. By the time you get to the end of the verse, it defeats it because it is clear that salvation requires a demonstration of belief. But that, it does mean that salvation isn't reserved for just one nation. Jesus says that salvation is of the Jews, but the rest of scripture teaches that it's not only for the Jews. When God makes his covenant with Abraham, he tells him that all the families of the earth will be blessed. Again, that doesn't mean that every family is going to be saved. The word for family in Genesis 12.3 means tribe or, or race. In other words, those being blessed or, or those being saved through the seed of Abraham, which finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ, will be from all the tribes and all the peoples of the earth. This means Jews will be saved, Greeks will be saved, Arabs will be saved, Russians will be saved, all the nations and tribes. You realize heaven is going to be so much more multicultural and diverse than our churches are. And I wish our churches looked more like heaven's going to look. But in looking at God's love, we need to know that he doesn't love us because of anything that's lovable in us. He loves us because it is in his nature to love. John tells us in his first epistle that God is love. And here in his gospel, he tells us that because God loved the world, he gave his son. In fact, that's the importance of that word so. I want to just hang out there for a second. God so loved the world. You know, a lot of times we read that and we, we read it like we typically use that word so today. We, we use that word so as an intensifier. It emphasizes the verb it's attached to. Like It's like reading it would be like, God so loved the world. He loved the world so much, right? And that's true. He did really love, right? He loved to the extent that you can love because he is the measure of love. But that's not how the word so is used here. That word literally means thus or in this manner. So if we read it that way, it says, for God so loved the world is really saying, and this is how God loved the world. He gave his son. Or God loved the world in the following way. He gave us his son. And then it tells us that manner in which God loved the world, which is the fact that he gave his son so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That is the way that God showed his love for the world. And that ties us right back to Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus in verses 14 and 15 when he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And that takes us to our third truth this morning. It ties in to number three, that love is demonstrated in action. And we're going to look at that from two angles real quick. First, God towards man, and then second, we'll look at man toward God. All right, God's love to man is demonstrated in action, and we have to recognize that. See, God doesn't just give us a new friend when he sent Jesus. He doesn't just give us company or a wise teacher or a moral leader. Jesus came on a specific mission. In verse 14, Jesus gives us a picture of this when he compares the work that he's going to do to the bronze serpent that's lifted up in the wilderness. He says, in the same way, the Son of Man will be lifted up. And we talked last week about how that foreshadows the death that Jesus was going to die, and it foreshadows the saving work of that death. And so we see that God's love toward man isn't a mere abstraction. It's demonstrated in a concrete historical event. In his first epistle, John writes this, 1 John 4, 8 through 10. He says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now that word propitiation, that just means to appease God or to satisfy God. But notice that he says that the love of God was made manifest. That word manifest means it was, it was made into a physical reality. This abstract thing, love, 
was manifested, was made into a physical, concrete reality that you could see and touch. And that physical manifestation of love is Jesus Christ. And God's love is demonstrated in the fact that Jesus Christ offered himself as a perfect sacrifice to appease or to satisfy the just wrath of God that was on us. Now, throughout the New Testament, we see that God's love is continually connected to his sacrifice, continually connected. So it's not just an abstract idea. It is, here's how we know that God loves us. How can you be sure? Christ, on the cross. That's all the evidence we'll ever need of God's love. We can never separate the cross from the gospel message because it is the witness to God's love, amen? And so we see that love is demonstrated in action, in relation to how God interacts with man, but we also see, I'll go over this one briefly, how man is to interact with God. John 14, 15, Jesus tells his disciples, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Now, that's not a test, that's not, uh, it's a statement of fact. It's not Jesus testing their love saying, well, if you really loved me, you would obey my commands. He's, He's making a statement of fact. He says, look, those who love me will, as a natural result of that love, obey my commands. Because love is demonstrated in action. We don't have to try to work that up. If we love somebody, we do seek to please them. We do seek to submit and yield and honor them. That's our third truth. Finally, tying this all together is our fourth truth that what we do reflects what we believe. And inversely, what we believe will determine what we do, right? I want to take you back again. We were there just before, but John 3.36. It says this, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Remember that? Here's what catches my eye as I, as I was reading that. Notice the phrasing of John 3.36. It says, Whoever believes in the Son, has eternal life. And and that's familiar territory by this point in John 3. We've heard it several times. uh, Verse 15 says, whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Verse 16, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned. And now again in verse 36 we see it. Okay, so that's common common ground here. But um, notice the rest of the phrase. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. Now, that's interesting. It says whoever believes has eternal life, but whoever does not obey shall not see life. And you would expect it to say believe, right? Whoever does believe, whoever doesn't believe. Now, some translations do say uh, believe, but it's actually not the same Greek word. I found that interesting. Typically, negatives of words in Greek are formed by adding a, a negative or a negating prefix to it. All right, We do the same thing in English, so we have like the words like humane, and we have inhumane. We just add a little prefix to it. We have biblical, we have unbiblical, right? Unbiblical. Yeah. So, but the Greek words here, well, I found this interesting, they're completely different roots. It's not just the same Greek word you know, with a negative in front of it. Uh, the first word, believe, means to be assured of something, to have faith in its truth. And the second word, now the second word's not totally different, they're not totally wrong for translating it as believe, um, but I think it's significant. It means not to be persuaded of something, but it carries this connotation, of this extension, meaning that especially to the point of non-compliance not believing something to the point of non-compliance. So that half the time that this word shows up in the, in the New Testament, it's translated as disobedience. And so this word carries the idea, I just love that this idea of relationship between belief and action is, is all there in that word. And I think that's important. It adds something to our understanding because isn't it true that what we do is always going to be influenced by what we believe? And the flip side, that what we do will always reflect or it will always reveal. You're doing something, that's going to reveal what you really believe. There's a woman that I know, again, I promise not to identify her, okay? And I will keep that promise because I do enjoy her company and I don't want to sleep on the couch tonight. So she can rest assured that her identity is safe with me and I will not name her, all right? So this, this woman, this woman, uh, told me a story about a time when she was a young girl and she loved Mary Poppins, all right? And on this one particular day, she grabbed an umbrella uh, when she thought nobody was around. And uh, 
she was completely lost herself in her imagination in the front yard, right? She's pretending she's Mary Poppins. She's doing all the songs and all the dancing. She's twirling the, the umbrella. She's jumping off the, the roof, you know, thinking she could fly. And she doesn't remember exactly how old she was, but she said old enough that she shouldn't have really been doing this, all right? Um, and we'll just leave that there. So anyway, sometime later, I don't know, I think it was like months later, she finds out that she wasn't as alone as she thought. In fact, all of her neighbors saw her and they watched the entire thing. They, they watched, entertained by the entire performance of her singing and dancing out there. And this woman, who shall remain nameless, was completely mortified, just so embarrassed, you know, thinking that everybody watched her out there thinking she was Mary Poppins. You know, see, she believed she was alone and it affected what she did, right? Now, that's a silly story, but the truth, I think, is so much more profound. The truth is this, that what we believe is always going to influence what we do, and what we do is always going to reveal what we believe. And here in John and elsewhere in Scripture, we hear this this beautiful, listen, this life-changing news that if we believe in Jesus Christ, if we believe that he is the Son of God and the Son of Man uh, who that God gave to be a substitute sacrifice, and a way to eternal life, then we will never die. Church, that is amazing news. And it's something that is relevant. I get a little twisted up about like churches trying to be relevant, trying to make this relevant and that. The gospel is relevant. It applies to the life of everybody. It's not just, it's not just good news for poor people. It's not just news for people who have a sad life and who have faced hardship in this world. It's not news that you can ignore because you have a happy marriage or because you got a fat 401k or because you have an impressive stock portfolio. Steve Jobs, you know, the founder of Apple, he died a little over uh, eight years ago from pancreatic cancer. He was only 56 years old. When he died, he was worth an estimated $10.2 billion dollars. Now, that's money that I can't even imagine, but just to give you a level of comparison, the largest bill we have now is a $100 bill, right, in typical circulation. He was worth $10.2 billion. Now, just $1 million in $100 bills would stack up 40 inches tall, and it would weigh 20 pounds, all right? That's just $1 million. Steve Jobs had more than 10,000 of those stacks of money, right? I mean, that's over 100 tons of paper money. It would weigh over 100 tons. If you stacked it up in $100 bills, it would be six and a half miles high. It's a lot of money. Now, not to belabor the point, but got my imagination going here. If Steve Jobs had lived to 100 years old, all right, he would have needed to spend more than $231 million every single year for the next 44 years just to spend the money that he had. That's assuming he didn't get interest, all right, on anything. But here's my point, listen. Not a single penny kept him from the inevitable end of all man. Shakespeare called death the great equalizer. It is the fate of every man and woman ever born. And man has wrestled to make sense of it for as long as history has been recorded, right? And what we believe, listen, what we believe about death and after death will determine what we do. And what we believe about life will determine what we do. And what we believe about God and what we believe about forgiveness and the resurrection will determine what we do. If we believe that this life is it, that after this is just a big nothing, we believe that we're just a step on the ladder of a random evolutionary process, then there is no limit to the horrors we are capable of. If we believe that there is no higher power than individual will and individual choice, then we could treat a fetus like a virus. We could treat a dog like a man. But if we believe that the light has come into the world and his name was Jesus, then we're going to believe the things that he teaches. And he tells us that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now that word perish there, I want to clarify this because, well, people die, right? So is Jesus a liar? He said we won't perish. That word perish there means to be destroyed or lost. Jesus clarifies it a little better in uh, John 11, 25. He's talking to Lazarus' sister. Lazarus has died at this point. He's talking to Martha and he tells her, I am the resurrection and the life. He says, whoever believes in me, though he die, 
yet shall he live. See, the fact is that Christians die. It doesn't make Jesus a liar. There will be a day when we take our last breath on this earth, and even believers will experience this. But if you believe in Jesus Christ, he promises that, th- that you won't be lost. You will not be destroyed. You will not be given over to destruction, but instead you will have life for all eternity. And when we believe this truth, it's going to influence the way that we behave, right? Quick look at verse 21. Verse 21 of our scripture we're looking at today says, whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been carried out in God. What's interesting about that verse is it says, Whatever, whoever does what is true. That's a little unusual. Normally we talk about doing what is right. We, we don't speak about doing what is true. We talk about believing what is true, but we don't talk usually about doing what is true. But I think it really emphasizes again just that connection between what we believe and what we do. See, belief has never been about merely paying God lip service. It's one thing to say that you believe that God is your defender. I love that song that we sang this morning. But it's another level of belief altogether to let God actually be your defender rather than taking up a posture of self-defense. It's one thing to say that you believe that God forgives, but it's another level of belief altogether to really let go of the guilt and the shame of a lifetime of mistakes and let God use you for his glory. It's one thing to say that you believe that God is perfectly holy, but it's another thing altogether to crucify your flesh and fight to keep yourself pure in a world that assaults us daily with all that appeals to our basest lusts. And when we fail, listen church, because we will fail, we need to acknowledge that our actions, what we do in our failing, reveals unbelief or it will reveal a wrong belief every time. Watch what that does, if we think about it that way. Watch what this does. When we see our sin as unbelief or wrong belief, it's no longer a question of trying harder, right? Because you don't fix unbelief by doubling down on your effort. If it was simply a matter of strength and resolve, that might work. But if you have a wrong belief or you find yourself struggling to believe, you can't fix it by an act of the will. You need to feed on truth. You need to prayerfully seek God until he reveals the truth that will set your belief right. And then what you do will reflect that belief. That's how you do what is true. Amen? So here is the gospel presented in this scripture today. Man's default state is one of condemnation. But God loved the world by giving his son Jesus to be the perfect sacrifice that we could never be. And if we believe in him, we will never die. We will act in a way that reveals what we believe. And if there's anyone here who's never given themselves to this truth before, I would love to pray with you after service or answer any questions that you may have about becoming a child of God. If there's anyone who would just love to pray after the service and just you've seen some things in your life, your actions revealing some unbeliefs or some misbelief, I would love to pray with you. But let's pray, church. Father, I thank you for your word. I pray that you regard our hearts. Lord, bring us toward your righteousness. And when, Lord, we fall and when we fail, show us your truth that will bring us back. Show us where we are in error of our understanding of your truth, that we might do what is true, that we might run to your light, willing to be exposed, willing, Lord, asking, begging you to expose us so that you might have your way in our lives, so that we might be sanctified through your mercy, through your gracious gift of Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed. I thank you for everyone here, for everyone who hears. I pray that their hearts would be enlightened to your truth, that we would live our lives for you alone. I ask all this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.